Hey everybody, this is Scott Mann, CEO and founder of Stability Institute, where we broker knowledge and connect stability professionals on complex stability problems all over the world. And I want to thank you for uh, joining us on another episode of Stability Television, or STAB TV as we like to call it. Uh, and today we are really fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Mark Weiner, uh, author of the book Rule of the Clan, who many of you, I'm sure, uh, have seen the video book review that I did, and you've heard me talk about his work in just about everything that I uh, that I speak on and uh, and blog on. I, uh, his work is a seminal work uh, on understanding the, the types of societies that that most of us as stability professionals work in. Uh, and uh, Mark and I connected uh, not too long ago, but we he's really been just been a prolific contributor to uh, to our work on understanding stability. So Mark, thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here. So today uh, we're going to uh, we're going to get into a range of, of topics on <laughs> on on clanism and understanding that and how it how it addresses uh, our work in stability. Mm -hmm. But my first question is, um, yeah, and, you, and you're a, you know you're, you're certainly a scholar on rule of law and you've mm -hmm. got a deep background on constitutional law. What led you to write on rule of the clan? What what mm -hmm. brought you to to this topic? Well, as a scholar of legal history, I was interested originally in the development of state legal institutions in medieval Europe. And so I was studying medieval legal history, and especially the legal history of uh, Germanic peoples. And one of the interesting facets of Germanic legal life, social and legal life, in the early medieval period is the extent to which the Germanic tribes engaged in feuding behavior and had a culture based on notions of honor and shame. And that study of Germanic dispute resolution led me especially to the history of medieval Iceland. It happens to have a very interesting uh, uh, history that just captured my imagination. And that led me to spend a semester teaching there in a small town in the very northern part of the country, right snug up against the Arctic Circle. And as I was teaching and thinking about this history of dispute resolution among Germanic peoples, including Icelanders, and their feuding and their uh, cultures of group honor and shame, I was also corresponding with some of my students who at the time uh, were serving in Afghanistan or Iraq or had recently come back. And the stories that they were telling me about what they were seeing really resonated with what I was studying, this very early history. And at a certain point, the two societies, Afghanistan and Iceland, sort of came together in my own mind like a kind of Tesla coil. And I thought, what is it that uh, the, the study of comparative law and comparative legal history might be able to contribute to our understanding of some contemporary problems that we face in the world today? Okay. All right. Um, so I guess the, uh, the the next question I'd have mm. for you is explain uh, from your perspective because uh, mm. a lot of us when we think about when we think about clans today, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like a, kind of an ancient, uh, you know, uh, an, 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 an ancient form of, of, mm -hmm. of governance or an ancient sure. form of, of society. Uh, I've even, you know, I've been in situations where in the diplomacy circles and conventional military circles and even in special ops, I've had folks tell me, hey, you know, that stuff really isn't relevant anymore. Are you serious? Uh, yeah. And, and there are still some folks out there who who are not dialed into the role of clans, I think. Uh, and, and so I'm wondering if maybe you could hmm. break it down for us. What What is the impact and relevance of clans hmm. in today's society? It's incredible to me that anyone would say that clans aren't relevant, especially in the military, I think. They're one of the most important forces of governance in places where the international community is involved. It's certainly uh, the, the form of social and legal organization that I call the rule of the clan is an old form of social organization, but that doesn't mean that it's simply ancient. Indeed, it's very modern, and it's modern because it exists very much with us in the world uh, today, and whether it's Afghanistan or Somalia or in even weaker uh, states where, where clans are seeking to co-opt uh, states for their own ends. No, the, the clan is far from uh, uh, a social and legal institution that's passed. It's with us very much today in the, in the present. You know, I think a reason that, um, that we maybe don't give 
credence to that uh, yeah. to the clan to the to the clan reality yeah. is that is, is is based on the, the the definitions that you break out in the early on in the book yeah. between societies of status and contract. Mm-hmm. I think in many ways our own Western biases yes. uh, that we bring from a society of contract we try to project onto. Uh, these societies of status, thinking that that's what's needed in this modern era. Right. Yeah, we, we live in a society in which our, our culture, our social organization, and importantly, our legal system, which is inextricably linked to our society and culture, is dedicated to fostering personal autonomy and individual choice and in which the individual is the primary constitutive element of the social, political, and legal system. Whereas in societies of status, I'm using the term of the great 19th century legal historian Henry Main, in societies of, of status, societies governed by what I call the rule of the clan, society, culture, law are all instead uh, dedicated to a relatively greater degree, not to an exclusive degree, but to a relatively greater degree uh, toward fostering the strength, the coherence, and the endurance of extended family groups. And individuals and their legal rights and obligations are significantly circumscribed depending on their role, their place, or their status within the extended kin group. And yeah, I think that it is a probably a very common and and understandable mistake that people make to project the institutions, social, cultural, and legal institutions, onto uh, onto other societies, and therefore to fund- fundamentally misunderstand uh, how they work and how we can best assist the people on the ground in facing the challenges that they that they do. Yeah, and you know, I was talking uh, today. In fact, yeah. I think you and I were discussing uh, mm. to Dr. John Holzman, uh, who yeah. wrote the book on uh, on T. E. Lawrence recently mm-hmm. and, uh, to begin the world over again. And and it was a, uh, and that was one of the things that he was saying that based on his research was that really since the days of T. E. Lawrence, we have had a tendency to project our own biases of society of contract mm-hmm. into these status based areas, these, mm-hmm. these areas where rule of the clan is, is prominent, and not give it the credence it deserves. So, with that in mind, could you maybe uh, break out a, a few more differences between status uh, and contract society? You know, you talk about honor and feud and, and, mm-hmm. and rule of law. Can you kind of distinguish between the two a little bit more? In that sure. Well, I think one significant difference in the justice systems, if we can speak just about that for, for a moment, between societies of contract and societies of status, is that societies of contract, that is societies whose legal systems are devoted to enhancing personal autonomy, are state-based legal systems. That is, they are relatively centralized, they are formalized, they're bureaucratic, they're based ultimately in a central government authority. Whereas in societies of status, uh, the legal system, dedicated as is to preserving group harmony, is customary, it's traditional, it lies outside of uh, formal bureaucratic processes, and it is essentially at its core local. And so uh, I think we were just talking about the the mistakes that people may make in thinking about uh, uh, how to interact with right. societies that are governed by the rule of the clan. One is to imagine that the rule of law that we're all seeking to help foster in a whole variety of societies across the world will look the same in, say, Afghanistan as it does in the United States. It's certainly an excellent idea, ultimately, to develop a robust system of appeals courts, for instance. Terrific. But ultimately, uh, justice in societies of status will be rooted in, at least initially, local uh, informal governance processes. Yeah. And, and there, are other, there are other differences as well. So, for instance, uh, the um, what you could call the constitutional decentralization of societies of status, that is the radical localism that you see, uh, for instance, in a place like uh, Afghanistan, you know, local down to each individual valley. 
that's inextricable from a certain type of culture and a set of cultural values. And the cultural values that enable this constitutional decentralization are the values of group honor and shame, and specifically the, the honor and shame of the extended kin or clan group to which individuals might belong. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things, uh, mm -hmm. kind of the backstory on the whole Village Stability Program, mm -hmm. what led us to you mm -hmm. and to the Stability Institute and a lot mm -hmm. of the kind of the epiphanies that we've had in the last couple of years is, you know, for the first decade, we kind of all got it wrong. Uh, we all pursued what Dr. Seth Jones called a top-down approach mm -hmm. uh, to uh, stabilizing these undergoverned, you know, clan-based areas, and things like conflict resolution, mm -hmm. you know, that were scarce resources in these areas. I mean, there's not a lot of arable land, uh, and so conflict resolution, you know, a critical component of local governance, local mm -hmm. stability. This is a this is a, a traditional clan approach, you know, mm -hmm. that has been traditionally done. Uh, but we didn't really, I think, even grasp the importance of that until we started to move into these rural communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, as we look at places like Syria, mm -hmm. Yemen, other places, uh, you know, we, we can't afford to make that mistake again. Mm -hmm. It took us almost nine years in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we have too many of those uh, left in us mm -hmm. uh, if we're going to intervene in these places. For sure, you could you could make. Uh, an analogy to, say, rural development uh, aid in the agricultural sector. So if you talk to some folks who, who work on the local level uh, in, in that area, you'll find criticisms that the USAID is sending in a tractor to assist farmers in a particular province that doesn't need a tractor. Instead, uh, the farmers may need to understand not to destroy the earthworms that aerate their land because they've forgotten that knowledge because the primary farmers in the area have have left and aren't passing it on to. And, and I think there's something very similar in the realm of, of justice that and the rule of law that we don't simply want to import institutions that we understand as being the core institutions of the rule of law. Instead, we want to understand and help foster institutions that are understood to embody the rule of law by uh, local folks. That brings up a really, really good point that I wanna, I wanna dive into a little bit deeper. Mm. And you brought it up, which is, mm. um, a lot of these rural areas that are, are, are clan societies, uh, yeah. and I'll, again, I'll go to Afghanistan, but it's not, yeah. it's not isolated That's... there. A lot of the traditional systems that we assumed, once in 09 when we started to value this bottom-up approach, mm. uh, we moved into these communities and we started to learn that, you know what, a lot of these traditional systems that did handle their own affairs, they're in bad shape. Yes. Uh, right. Elders and cons that were run out by, that were pushed out by the Soviets and then the mm -hmm. Civil War and then the mm -hmm. Taliban and then us. Yeah. Uh, what that's done in a feudal type society or a clan society, it has essentially degraded the informal yeah. civil society capacities. Right. Here. And so as we wrestle with our role as advisors and practitioners, uh, our ability to understand what clan society looks like in its best of conditions, I think, yeah. is essential if we're going to even start to address what's been damaged. Right. Yeah. Surely that's that's the case. And bearing, thinking about that, of course, you need to bear in mind that clan societies are under the right conditions, extraordinarily good at maintaining a certain type of stability. If not peace, then the absence of war. At the same time, and at the same time providing justice. At the same time, there are downsides, you could say, to uh, clan societies and the type of stability they provide and the type of justice that they provide, at least from our perspective. One of the downsides from the point of view simply of uh, uh, stability or security is that when clan societies are stable, there can be a very rough and long-term peace, but clan societies can quickly degenerate into a very fragmented, um, they can fragment into a war of many clans against many other sure. clans. and. 
and at the same time the justice that can be provided raises, at times, not always, certain concerns from international human rights norms. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the challenge, as, as I would see it as a constitutionalist and as a comparative legal historian, is to figure out ways to help foster the very best of local, informal, traditional justice in societies that have undergone terrible uh, conflict and whose justice systems, local justice systems, have been degraded by, as you say, not only the Soviets, but by actions that the United States has undertaken to help those societies, uh, to help foster local, um, indigenous, traditional justice in those societies, but then at the same time to figure out the right way to link or align right. central right. government institutions with traditional institutions. Right. I think that's the, the really big outstanding question, not only in Afghanistan, on which you're the expert, but globally. So like my, my terrain is the, the terrain of academic scholarship. Uh -huh. And if you look out over the terrain of academic scholarship, I think you find that people haven't really figured this one out. Right. And the only way that uh, people will be able to figure it out is by talking with uh, folks uh, who've been there on the ground trying to provide stability at the local level. Now that's great and it's, it's, so, it's so funny you say that because um, something I want to share with you mm. and I want to get your perspective on mm. is, is in the uh, village stability process, mm. that's a methodology that we crafted mm -hmm. over a period of time and it evolved and we learned mm -hmm. as we went uh, and as Holzman says, you know, you, you, even T. E. Lawrence, he kind of figured it out as he went. Mm, uh, mm. But the, the 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 point here is that this thing evolved. And but one of the things that we did figure out early on is that we always we always wanted, and I think uh, a lot of Afghans wanted to connect top to bottom. Mm -hmm. There was no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But the problem was that coming from the top has never really worked in that area. <laughs> no. Yeah. And so the last. So yeah. for our methodology and our right. approach, and this right. sometimes gets lost in the clan conversation, the you know, revitalizing clan society is not the end game. Right. No. It, it is it, it is a means be. to connect to the top. Absolutely. Uh, so it's a matter of timing. Instead of saying I'm from the government, how do you like me so far? Right. You know, right. we, we start at the bottom right. and we, right. we work through something that's legitimate and credible at a right. local level. And then when the time is right, when yeah. relationships are established and, and trust is there, you make connections that are locally appropriate, viable and sustainable. Yeah. I mean, it would be a it would be a mistake to think uh, of the end game of Afghanistan or many other places in the world as being a, a society of a, a, a tribal federation. That's not what it's going to be. But... Uh, the uh, tribes and the subunits that uh, we sometimes call uh, clans and their form of of justice and secure this types of security they provide that has to be the way that ultimately uh, the the kind of institutions that we want to see develop uh, in those places grow it, it ultimately also by connecting with the the liberal, government-oriented, often elite centralizers that uh, in Afghanistan are, say, in, in Kabul. But how to connect those up, that's essential. And it, you, can, you can look at the United States as uh, a parallel. Look at the whole history of Germanic societies. Ultimately, uh, the, the state, government, and the, ultimately the kind of liberal government that we have grows and grew from the bottom up. It wasn't so right. No, that's that's a that's a that's, you know. that's a great analogy, and uh, and I think across the world we can see examples of of, of the bottom up mm. approach. But you know, the interesting thing is, mm. uh, I, I and I don't know exactly why this is, but we do have a tendency, uh, for whatever reason, that when we project policy, it's always top down. You know, and, mm -hmm. and even though in many cases it, it doesn't really pass the common sense test, when it manifests into reality, that's what we do. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of it is continuing to bring awareness to policymakers, strategists, and even local tacticians mm -hmm. on the realities of local areas in terms of, of both status and contract society, mm -hmm. that they are both relevant, that they yes. both matter. Uh, and so I, I'm curious yes. in your thoughts on this. If, yeah. if, if we're looking at an area, a new area, that we're, we're considering an yeah. intervention, sure. 
how should a senior leader or a planner, you know, or a tactician think about that area in terms of understanding the local realities? What kind of things should he be thinking about when he's kind of defining the the, the logic of that area? Hmm. Well, that's a big question. Uh, and a very practical one. Here are some thoughts that that it leads me to. One, any assistance provided by the international community to those areas, people have to be in it for the long term. And I think the that's often hard to sustain politically right. within liberal democratic states, but uh, pulling out too early raises very profound ethical problems. Yeah. So you have to be in it for the very long, the very long term. Uh, I would say also that the the institutions that foster the rule of law and stability and all those good things, uh, they're not going to be solely the institutions that we know, uh, for instance, in the United States. It may be much more important to, rather than fostering, say, national elections, which, don't get me wrong, are very important and, and uh, support free, fair, democratic elections wholeheartedly, but at the very early stages of international assistance to any community, it may be much more important for a local villager to be able to resolve a dispute about a well right. or about uh, where uh, grazing land than, than, uh, than elections, uh, which have to be, of course, the, the long-term goal, but to actually develop a government that's perceived as legitimate, the government has to be able to, and the legal system, has to be able to address the needs of the people who actually live in the society. So, two. Um, I think also, maybe, maybe in relation to, to that issue, to, to try to have people who are sensitive to the ultimate goal of, of linking up, of lining, of connecting, how, whatever term you want to describe, local, informal, traditional, customary governance with central government institutions, play a kind of coordinating uh, oversight role in uh, a process that obviously involves all aspects of the social right. spectrum. Yeah. I think that's very, that's very important because often you can have uh, aspects of some international intervention in a society that have nothing per se to do with, with the legal issues but have profound consequences for local traditional justice. I think that I think that's. Uh, Those are three really good ones. Yeah, not bad. No, that's uh, three hey, really how good about ones. I add one more? Okay. Here's one more, and it relates to something that, in fact, we were just talking about uh, before we came into this room. I think that senior policy level folks ought to be more sensitive to the cultural components of stability and, and the rule of law in particular. I described earlier in our conversation that the constitutional decentralization of the rule of the clan is inextricable from its culture of group honor and shame. And therefore, I think any uh, international assistance to uh, communities that are coming out of conflict have to also support, and this I think, especially to a lot of the folks that you may speak to in the military may seem radical or unusual or strange, but I, I really mean it in a very practical way. Uh, those international projects ought to especially think about cultural issues. And I mean like the arts and uh, literature and poetry and have people from the NEA or the NEH uh, on boards that are thinking about uh, international assistance. I think that's essential because just as the rule of the clan combines constitutional decentralization with a culture of group honor and shame, so the liberal rule of law also has a cultural component and we need to do what we can to foster that cultural life. I think that's great and uh, you know you said so many things there but a couple things is <laughs> on that line right there I, I think that that's something that the Institute will try to do more of. <laughs> 
uh, is to try to open the aperture on that and, yes. and to see where a good there are avenues that. like that. And yeah. maybe that's something you and I can work together on. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I want to go back to another point that you made uh, about, about, about understanding kind of the local realities. And I yeah. think this is something I, I would just ask our viewers to remember, hmm. is that most of these areas, um, the, the informal civil society mechanisms, yeah. whether it's security, economic development, or governance, one, they have their own operating logic that we might not understand, that mm. we need to probably understand. And that's, yeah. that's why I think your book, Rule of the Klan, is so important. But also, it's not a safe assumption that these things are functioning like they should be. Right, right. In, in, indeed, in conflict societies that are riven by conflict, it's likely that they're not. Right. Mm. And yep. in today's age of global violent extremism, yep. those are the very threads that are pulled by violent extremists. Sure. It, it, it is, that is the opportunity, the strategic opportunity uh, that, that puts everything at risk is that uh, it's bad enough that these informal civil society systems are damaged, but now they're exploited yeah. uh, for tra you know for transnational gain. Yeah, I mean, you know, to think about Afghanistan, which you know so well, I think there are very few people in the world who want to be ruled by militant theocrats. Right. But if uh, a group can provide uh, predictable, secure, uh, swift, uh, or at least expeditious justice to resolve the fundamental disputes that people have in their society, uh, and no one else is uh, doing is doing it, guess who's going to win? Yep, absolutely. And so. that's, a, that's a great message to, to shift off of right there. Mm. Um, I, I also, um, you talk in your book about um, the, the different types of clan society, <laughs> you know, that you give different examples. And I think it's also... Uh, I think it's worth our time here. If you could mm. talk maybe a little bit about, um, it, it, you know, it, it's probably not going to be a purely clan society that we see and operate in. There's going to be oh, no. different looks at it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, the rule of the clan, you can, you can understand the rule of the clan is existing along a, a wide spectrum. So there are very traditional tribal uh, societies that you know quite quite well, especially in the areas of the Pashtun insurgency. Uh, in uh, in Afghanistan, that are rather close to a kind of ideal type of society of status that Henry Main described, but certainly within any given society, uh, in, in Afghanistan, uh, there are forces that are strongly supportive of uh, an ideal of liberal democratic life. But but even even more, I think in the world today you can see societies that have some aspect of, uh, of the ideals of a clan society ranging from those very traditional societies. Think of Afghanistan or Yemen or Somalia uh, or Mali uh, through societies with weak states that are on the road to a certain type of more central, hopefully ultimately liberal uh, governance regime, but in which, because of the weakness of the state, uh, a, a kind of clanism logic operates, often seeking to co-opt the institutions of the state for its own ends, a particularly dangerous set of affairs. You can think of Nigeria, maybe Palestinian Authority, parts of the Philippines. But the rule of the clan even can exist within uh, quite modern, developed uh, states. Not only, I'm thinking, not only of, say, the behavior of criminal syndicates and drug gangs in Mexico, but even within the core of, say, American inner cities in which gang behavior can really mirror in very interesting ways the kind of feuding and honor-based uh, notions of society that exist in more traditional uh, clans. You hit the perfect segue. The next question yeah. I was going to ask oh. you was about cities and, and gangs and mafia and crime. Yes. I mean, clan society... Uh, we often think we, it's almost uh, like a synonym for tribe. And in reality, mm -hmm. um, and you even say this in your book, you mm -hmm. really prefer clan mm -hmm. as, as, as kind mm -hmm. of the, the, the primary nomenclature there. Can, can, can you talk about mm. um, 
uh, clans manifesting in uh, mega cities, urban areas, yeah. uh, and, and, and kind of what that might look like. Yeah, I should say two two things before I address the question. First, that the term clan is a highly contested one within mm -hmm. anthropology. So I think many people would find my use of it quite controversial. But le leaving that aside, even more importantly, uh, before we talk about uh, the clan-like behavior of gangs in the inner cities, I think it's important to stress that although there are parallels between uh, gangs in inner cities and the type of feuding behavior we see and the kind of feuding behavior that you saw in, say, medieval Iceland or uh, contemporary uh, Somalia, uh, wherever you look around the, the world, the uh, gangs of inner cities differ, and say drug gangs in Mexico, differ in a fundamental, absolutely essential way, which is that they are devoted to unlawful behavior. Right. Uh, whereas that's not the case. We don't want to think this way about traditional clans sure. or tribes. These are lawful societies. Right. But uh, turning to, to American inner cities or inner cities in, in many parts of the what we would call the, the developed world, in the absence of effective institutions of government, other forms of social organization rush to fill the vacuum of power and to provide some kind of order that people crave. There's always some uh, group, if government is not effective in providing the rule of law, either on its own or in conjunction with traditional local institutions, there's always some group that's waiting to leap in and provide its own distinct kind of justice. And um, often those groups provide a kind of justice that is, uh, ought to be profoundly troubling to anyone who believes in liberal democratic life. And that's, you know, that's such, a, that's such an important point. And, and really this is for a lot of our folks uh, hmm. watching. Um, we do put a lot of emphasis on clan and tribal society, Mark, in, in our operations. Mm. And sometimes I think we, we, we tend to default to that as the, as the ideal arrangement in some of these areas. And, and in mm. reality, in your book, I mean, you make a pretty prolific point that if we fail to see the, the, the potential risks associated with clanism. Oh, yes. Even our own societies of contract where the, the freedoms and liberties of the individual could potentially be at peril. And, yes. I, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because I think it speaks to those of us who, who do work around these societies mm -hmm. and do have to set our strategic end game appropriately. Mm -hmm. Well, the... I think that the problems that people face around the world when they are in circumstances in which rule of law institutions, legal institutions, governance institutions have been degraded, that's not simply something that exists elsewhere. It's our challenge too. And I think anyone who's interested in the, the rule of law needs to think about making common cause, both practically and imaginatively, with uh, people who are facing these challenges overseas. So I, I don't see the, the challenges of maintaining a society of contract and maintaining a liberal democratic uh, way of life as fundamentally different here in the United States as anywhere else in the world. There are just different local local realities. But you bet your bottom dollar that a, when government institutions, should government institutions uh, here or anywhere else degrade, you will see a very similar kind of uh, behavior, actually far worse, uh, than uh, you would see in, um, say, pl places that you know very, very well. Yeah, yeah. No, I, that's uh, that, that that's well said. And you know, even the village stability uh, operations methodology uh, that that a lot of us uh, work mm -hmm. with, I think, is is un misunderstood sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. That the end game is to is to basically revitalize tribal structures oh, gosh. Uh, and for us yeah. we you know no. it really that's only a small part of it it's 
we do yeah. that in order to make long-term connections to the state. Right. The, yeah, the, the, the end game is not, cannot be, and it won't be for any place when, in which the international community is concerned, of a tribal, a nation that is essentially a tribal federation. That, that, that's, that's not the, the end state that is desirable. Instead, the end game has to be the development of modern, liberal, democratic institutions that will take many, many, many years to develop, but will, hopefully in time, do so with the right attention, the, the right kind of fostering mentality, and a mentality that does begin at the local, uh, non-traditional, customary governance uh, level. But, but the the role of engaging with uh, tribes and, and, and tribal subunits and, and clans is not, ought not to be, I think, to uh, support them per se, uh, but instead to support them as part of a uh, linkage with central government institutions. Yeah. In, in a way that's ethical and right. effective and sustainable. Right. So. Um, Circle back here because yeah. I, I want to really make sure that we hit this. One yeah, and yeah, sure. On camera here. Okay. The time involved in this thing. I mean, even under the best of conditions in a clan society, say Southern Afghanistan, nineteen uh, twenties to nineteen seventies, clan society was pretty robust. It worked pretty well. Even in the best of times, mm -hmm. look at the you know how King Zahir Shah and the mm -hmm. amount of time it took for him to try to connect those two over. Mm -hmm. He knew this would be a very long term effort. My point that I'm trying to make to reinforce what you've said is, this is a long-term effort under the best of conditions in clan society. If oh, clan man. society is broken, we've got to settle in for the long haul and be prepared to do this for a very long time. Oh, and yeah. I think in Afghanistan, we really, we missed that one. You know, we, we started to do this bottom-up program in 09. Yes. And, you know, now we're looking at possibly going to zero uh, yes. in 2014. And there's no way in the world that yeah. you could ever hope to bring those two societies together. This is a multi-generational effort. Oh, gosh. I, I mean, so it's, it's 2014 now. It's five years. Yeah, try 100. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And, and for yeah. Paul, you know, one of my questions to yeah. you, uh, kind of my wrap-up question yeah, was, sure. you know... But, uh, but we can keep talking because this is good. Right. <laughs> Message to policymakers. Yeah. I think that's a big one, is you, right. you've, got to, you've got to consider the magnitude of the task at hand. Yeah. And what you're asking uh, practitioners to do is going to take a very long time. Yes. Yes. No no question. The, this is this is I mean and you only have to look to the time it took for the state to develop effectively in the Western Europe. But I think that's that's not to say that that it can't be done and that very important things can't be, achievements can't be had even in a relatively short-term horizon, short-term, I mean, I don't know, 10, 20 years. And, and I think that's important to bear in mind as well. If you look again to, to Afghanistan, you know, a few decades ago, they were developing quite interesting, robust, important uh, central uh, institutions. And the linkages between the bottom and top, well, that's the nut to crack. It and, really is. Yeah, and, yeah. It's, and it takes a long time. Yeah, and you brought that up, and I, and I want to reinforce that one too, is that there has to be an appreciation for local realities at every level, from mm -hmm. policy down to tactician. Mm -hmm. you know, everyone has to, I think, appreciate what's, what the realities are. Yeah. And if you've got a, if you've got a policy administration or, or strategists mm -hmm. that, that, that don't Get the the magnitude and the realities of clan of rule of the clan. Yeah, uh, it's going to be real tough to execute. Yeah. I, I wonder actually. Maybe I could pose a question back to you. Uh, if I think it's not simply a matter of of appreciation, though that's extraordinarily important, but also perhaps believing that many international efforts ought to be in some sense locally driven and the priorities within international efforts to provide stability, to provide the rule of law, ought to be set significantly at the, at the local level. Do, do you see, did you see that in your own? We started to see that in Afghanistan and even with USAID and some of their programs were mm -hmm. specifically designed for local application. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and and frankly, uh, you know, some pretty impactful stuff. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, those were implemented very late in the game, yeah. and as policy waned in Afghanistan, yeah. it it was boxed up with all of the other, uh, you know, counterinsurgency interventions that were not. Uh, favorable, right? And so the answer, the, the short answer is yes, we did see it, but unfortunately, uh, I think unless we keep this narrative going in this kind of environment, uh, we're going to be hard pressed to see that in other places uh, because it's kind of been forgotten. Right. right. You know? So uh, yeah, I suppose I mean there's a real practical question. You can appreciate the type of governance structures that have existed and to some extent still do exist in. Uh, many of the societies that we're talking about, and that's great, that's important. It helps you understand the challenges. It may help you understand some of the solutions as sure. well. But then to, I suppose, operationalize right. that understanding, right. that's, yeah. that's hard. Well, you know, we have four pillars at the Stability Institute. Mm. The first one is appreciate local realities. Mm. The, the second one is, uh, is uh, foster stability from the bottom up mm -hmm. and, and across all lines of effort. And so that's kind of the operationalizing of it. The third is to collaborate across the stability network. Mm -hmm. So different disciplines, uh, academia, uh, you know, dogs and cats living together, uh, a real right. eclectic mix of stability right. coming together to look at this and frame it. And then finally... Is, is building stability tradecraft, uh, mm -hmm. similar to what we've talked about here. Yeah. So, for example, a Green Beret hmm. who's working in a rural area fundamentally understands rule of the clan. <laughs> so if he goes into this mm -hmm. area and he sees clearly that conflict resolution is, is, is degraded, right. he might not be able to fix it, but he at least knows enough to recognize it yes. and, and to who, who he should reach out to. Yes. Mark Weiner at worldsofflaw.com. <laughs> Or something. Oh, like oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, one step at a time. That's right, uh, right. that's an awfully big uh, <laughs> wait. I'll I'll do what I can. Yeah, but uh, okay. So my last question to you, as we wrap yeah. up here, is um, uh, we've talked about a lot about policymakers, but mm. you know our folks that who are mostly the members of the institute. You know they're they're the guys and gals with their sleeves rolled up every day in these mm -hmm. in these rough places. You know, doing really noble work to try to connect top and bottom. Yeah. And, you know, th there's there's a lot about their mm. job that is very difficult. And I'm wondering if maybe uh, just as kind of a parting shot to yeah. them, you could give them some thoughts uh, on, on, on perhaps how to think about clan society hmm. and, and some things that maybe they might, uh, they might do to, to, to prepare mm -hmm. uh, for that mm -hmm. and, to, and to just to understand it better. Mm -hmm. Practical tips from a scholar. Yeah, there you go. Sure. Well, well let, me, let me say one, uh, one thing first uh, related to the, the last thing we were just kind of joking about, and that is that, uh, of course, the people who can provide the very best advice within the scholarly community to uh, folks on the ground are especially area specialists. Mm -hmm. And I just want to stress sure. that. Um, well, here, here, uh, here are a couple of, of, I suppose, tips that I could give that are generally applicable really to any kind of work. And it's the same tip that I gave my law students whenever I, or that I give my law students whenever I teach. I teach my law students, I say, if you really want to be effective in an argument, you need to be able to inhabit fully, imaginatively, the very best, strongest position of your opponent. And you need to be able to articulate that position even better than your opponent can. Because it's only by articulating the position of your opponent that you can then address it properly sure. and, and effectively. And Stuart Diamond calls that the pictures in their heads. The pictures in their heads. Understanding the pictures in their heads, yeah. And I suppose you could then use a, I don't know, a business metaphor and say if you're, if you're in an environment and people are buying a, a set of, of goods, call those goods a particular vision of, of justice or, or government, then you need to understand what it is that makes those goods attractive. What's your competitor doing that is uh, fostering the, the interest of uh, a population? And if you understand why the goods on offer, the alternative goods on offer, 
are uh, sometimes uh, effective, then you can understand just what it is, what needs, what local on the ground needs they're meeting, and try to be able to do things even, even better. So I suppose that's a, that's a kind of constitutional lawyer's uh, piece of advice. No, it's well said. I mean, I mean to, to kind of take uh, your last point there, I mean, sources of instability and grievances. Yeah. Uh, certainly in these rural areas, you know, are very pronounced. And looking at how, say, for example, the Taliban mm. uh, at a very local level uh, go into these areas and, and provide goods and services right. that address those grievances right. when not only the government, the government can't and really never has been able to right. to a, an effective degree, right. no. but the traditional society did. Yes. And now it can't. Right. And so... You know, within that statement that I that you just made and that I just made, I think there are quite a few opportunities there that local practitioners mm -hmm. can start to develop a, a capacity to do, mm -hmm. understand what right looks like, mm -hmm. what informal civil society looks like, what rule of the clan looks like, understand what's broken, mm -hmm. and then understand what your competitors are doing to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think those are three mm -hmm. things that I just heard you say. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. All right. So. Mm -hmm. Well, Mark, look, uh, I've ran you a lot longer than uh, I, I, I probably should have. But, no, uh, no, not at all. It's, it's, it's been an honor to have you with us. You'll come back again, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, maybe next time we could talk about how important it is to learn uh, the uh, poetry of traditional societies. Absolutely. Excellent. And warrior poetry. Yeah. Let's talk about poetry. Absolutely. Um, so, Mark, again, <laughs> thanks for sitting in here with us. Really My appreciate pleasure. it. Um, and for all of you uh, dialed in to uh, uh, this interview with Dr. Mark Weiner, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, and we'll have more for you uh, in future videos. In the meantime, I do hope that you'll share this video interview uh, with those in your uh, social circles and networks. Uh, share, uh, like us, all those good things, and, and help us broaden the message to get it out there to folks that can really benefit uh, from this type of bottom-up approach and local appreciation. And until next time, this is Scott Mann, uh, CEO and founder of the Stability Institute, and thanks for watching.